you know, I want to I want to get to Luke in chapter eight, but uh, as as I was preparing as as best I could for tonight for you guys, um, here's what I saw: is that uh, most of us in this room uh, come from what we call a denominationalism, and and that means like. You grew up in the church in some sort of denomination, or you got saved, and then you were plugged into a denomination. And essentially, denominations just mean a series of beliefs that you come into agreement with, and you say, okay, this is what we believe. The challenge with aligning yourself with a group of people that believe certain things is two things. Number one, beliefs change. Like, did you ever believe that you could take a picture with your phone like 10 years ago? Now you do, like now you can. What if you set up a religion, like we're the non-phone taking pictures because it'll never happen religion, and all of a sudden now everybody's taking pictures with their phone and it's a truth and a reality, yet you set up a whole, and it sounds silly, right? It sounds, it sounds like, let's just call it what it's, it sounds stupid. But religion is equally actually worse than that because we set up these beliefs and then anybody that comes into the little group, let's say me and Ronnie and Chris and Natalie created the no pictures on your phone religion. Ronnie's kicked out automatically. Give me this, give me this phone. Look, he's got an iPhone 6 now. So, Ronnie, we're going to have to ask you to leave our religion, okay? Bye. Even though we've been in relationship for 10 years, you're out because you don't align with our beliefs. The challenge with re- aligning yourself with beliefs alone is that it destroys covenant relationships. And covenant relationships essentially are family. When we come into covenant relationships, it's family. This young man not only came into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, washed by the blood, but he came into the family, both us and our Heavenly Father as the Father. And in that family, you can still sit at the table and break bread and have different beliefs. It, let me put it in another way. Um, when you sit at the table at Thanksgiving, everybody in your family has different beliefs about everything, politics, religion, money, whether you should watch the game after, the, after you eat turkey, whether you should take it. Everybody has different beliefs. But the covenant relationship through the blood says, despite our different beliefs, we're going to stay together in relationship and love one another and, and into eternity, regardless, right? Does this make sense? And so one of the things I, I see about covenant relationships is that they're all eternal and they're all unique. One of the blessings about coming into a family that doesn't just establish itself around beliefs, now we do have core beliefs in here as a church, but first we establish it out of a culture of honoring the Christ in you and that that brings you into a family of Christians and that that is eternal and that supersedes any belief or unbelief or difference in beliefs that we have. Someone should be saying like, amen, because this is the gospel. I mean, like we're called into this as a family and there's freedom in it. And I was waiting for that word to come forth during worship I gotta say, I gotta, I'm just going to say this. This is what the Lord told me to write down. Our job, your job, is to manage yourself in a culture of honor. It's no one else's job to manage you. It's also not your job to manage anybody else. Like, this is where if you come from another denomination, you're like, is this where I get up and leave? Because that's so different than what I'm used to. Your job's to manage you. And I want to talk about that tonight. We all, we all know that in a culture of honor, there's a core, and it's freedom. She, she started singing the word freedom. I'm like, all right, Lord, thank you. And if you look at my notes, that's like the whole message. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, we all know there's freedom, Right? One of the things that comes in a culture of honors is is it breeds the love of God. It allows the love of God to move. And we we understand through the word of God that the perfect love of God casts out all the fears. But it equally would be said that, that fear can cast out 
love, right? So fear is, is the breeding ground of a loveless culture. And fearful people, people that are afraid, control. If you have anybody in your life that's controlling, they're afraid, deeply afraid. They, they more than likely won't admit it or don't even know it. If you're controlling, if you're like, uh, I, you know, if you're controlling, even if it's controlling yourself or others around you, at the core, you're dealing with fear. And <laughs> that perfect love needs to invade that place where you have to have control. Um, I want to stick to this culture of love and this lifestyle of honor because I feel like this is where we're going to carry this momentum from this past week. When you don't have honor and freedom, you operate out of the enemy's plan, and the enemy's plan is fear. <sighs> Not only do people look then to control others, they take the next logical step, which is illogical in religion, and they justify that control. It usually sounds something like this. I'm doing this because I love you. And then those same people teach that God is like that too. And so <laughs> they're like, you think I'm controlling? You should meet God. You know, he's super controlling, you know, and that's not who he is. I'm going to prove that's not who he is, even though I don't have to prove it. <sighs> Where does that come from? Like, I, I'm just sitting up here. I'm like, where does that even come from that that teaching? I, I think I know where it comes from, but it really comes from a lack of honor. It comes from a lack of love. It comes from lack. It comes from a lack of leadership. It comes from true leaders and trust, like being trustful of one another, being loved. And scared leaders teach that, that, that good people should control you. And that's not true. Good people should not control you. Good people should be giving you the liberty to operate in the Spirit because the same Spirit is in you is the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And the same Spirit that's in you is the same Spirit that's in me. And if we can't agree upon anything, we can agree that the Spirit in you is the same that's in me, which makes us family, which means despite our beliefs or disbeliefs or unbeliefs or contrary beliefs, we believe that Christ Jesus is in each other and we honor that. And most of us go through our whole life looking for breakthrough from the next big speaker that comes through or the next awesome book that you read from a huge leader that has, seems to have it all put together. And I'm here to tell you that in this body of believers, especially at the church in New Bern, the breakthrough you're looking for is sitting right next to you more than likely or right behind you or right in front of you. And God does this to us. He will give me a word in my life and I know that it's for me, and I look for the confirmation, and he uses, usually uses the person that I'm like the most conflicted with in my beliefs, or the person who just rubs me the wrong way, or just the person I'm like, there's no way, and then that person comes to me and like, God told me this for you. And I'm like, mm. and it doesn't come in the package that I want it to come in. Do you know what I mean? God's confirming word often won't come in the package that you assign to it, because he wants, you, he wants to ask you, do you want the package or you do you want me? Do you want what it's coming in or do you want what's coming, which is me? I'm telling you, what's coming is not going to look at the, the pretty packaging with the bow on the top that you want it to. We all say this, but we have to get to where we know this. We all say we believe what God's going to do isn't going to look like what we want. But then we say it as if we know what it is going to look like. Do you know what I'm saying? We don't know. We don't know. God will use the, the foolish things to confound us. He will use the, I mean, how can he use a short, bald-headed, big, red beard, tattooed guy to bring a revival atmosphere in this church to where I don't know if I've ever felt the glory of God residing when someone's ministering and just speaking out of their heart as much as he did this past week. That's not the package that you would put it in. It's the package he would put it in. Because you have to decide, am I wanting the pretty package or am I wanting Christ? And am I wanting God? It should be encouraging for a lot of us because you're like, my package is kind of messed up and <laughs> he can still use me. Right? 
That was me talking to me. I'm not talking about you. You're all beautiful and perfect. And <laughs> like, God was having me write these things down, and I'm just like, I asked him, and I'm going to ask you, are you, God, are you sure that they're ready to hear this? Like, I don't think, I'm like, I don't think we're ready to hear this. And he's like, just keep writing, son. Just keep writing. <sighs> Control and freedom is what I'm here to talk about tonight through culture. And the word control is what I want to talk about because we do need to have control in the church. When I said no control in the church, if you freaked out on the inside, this message is especially for you. Because it isn't that we need to have control over one another. We're to have the fruit of the Spirit, which is called self-control. Remember, my job isn't to control you. It's to control myself. This is a fruit of the Spirit. In particular, Jesus, whose perfect theology walks in this perfect self-control, and he does this constantly where he's managing and controlling himself, so much so that he says this in John 5, 19, I'm not going to do anything on my own, but I'm only going to do what I see the Father doing and saying. That's how much self-control Jesus walked in. Amen, Brent. <laughs> Jesus is the master of self-control. And the ministry of the gospel of good news is that you can be free totally, completely, like Adam and Eve, you know, in the garden. I mean, naked and free, you know what I mean? Uh, not in here, but in the garden. You can be naked and free and in unity and in marriage and full of love and aware of the constant presence of God. That's what we're called to, the garden, the freedom that's in Christ. But, but God then put two trees in the garden. So this, this perfect atmosphere that God wants us to have, where there's unity and marriage and beauty and, and there's cool in the day, and it's, it must have been warm, right? They're naked, right? So it had to have been reasonably warm, I'm assuming. So, so did here's the question the Lord posed to me. Did, did I, did God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Yes or no? Yes, he did. Did he put a poor choice in that perfect place? Now that stumped me. If you had the answer, you're way smarter than I am. I said, and the Lord asked me, did I put a poor choice in a perfect place? And the answer is no. He didn't put a poor choice there in a perfect place. But a perfect place, in order to have freedom and be filled with freedom, requires a poor choice as an option in order for you to be perfected. Because we have free will. If that tree isn't in the garden, then it's basically just a glorified prison. Right? But he loves you so much that he allowed you to choose every other fruit of the tree until you finally got to the one where you're like, I'll take the fruit of Jesus, and you bid into it, and you realize this is that which I've been looking for my whole life. This is that perfect choice. This is that reunion into the community, into the family, into the blood. Despite my past, he doesn't care. I'm now brought back in. Whew. You get to make the choice. And if we don't get to make choices when you're, when you're preaching the gospel, you're just leading people into a prison if you don't think that there's free choice, because there is free choice. Holy Spirit. So this is where we come, where we've, we've had this amazing weekend, and, you, and I've got this word, and I'm like, Lord, what's next? And he's like, Brent, the people can only give what they have. And this is where we come to Luke in chapter 8, and more importantly, probably like in verse, maybe go down to 37 to 40, there's this guy named Jarius in here. And Jarius comes to Jesus, uh, I think he's a, a religious leader, and he comes to Jesus and says, will you heal my daughter? Please come to my house. My daughter's totally like sick. She's dying. If you don't heal her, she's going to die. And, and Jesus says something here that, that's like the key to this whole thing I want to talk about tonight. I, is that clock right? <laughs> the big clock came off the wall. Jesus says, and this is the key to everything. He asked her, him, if he would come to the house, and Jesus says, yes. Like, that seems simple, right? 
But Jesus is in control of Jesus. Being in self-control, he's in control of himself. And he says, yes. He goes, he heals her. Here's the key, though. As soon as he's trying to go on his way to her in verse, I think it's 42, 43, he starts to go to Jairus' house, and he's pressed in by a crowd of people that are, that are what? Like excited that Jesus is there? They're desperate, right? And this is where the woman with the issue of blood comes in, right in that same section, right? She comes rushing in. She presses through the crowd, the frenzy of people who are desperate. We all know her story. Many of us know her story. She's totally desperate. She touches his hymn. And why I'm saying, why, why do I say that the word yes is the most important thing? When you learn to say yes like Jesus did, you also learn that you have to say no sometimes if you have total self-control. Why didn't he minister to everybody there? Did he not love them? He loves them. Why didn't he stop and why didn't he set up healing lines? Why didn't he bring everybody up to, bring everybody up to the front and Jesus will pray for them? This is important to understand where we're going. Self-control. Self-control. He, Jesus is in constant control of himself here. Jesus tells Jesus where to go. Desperate people don't tell Jesus where to go. Oh, we're desperate for you, God. Are we the crowd that gathers around him, just begging to just touch him? Or are we the one that comes to him and says, look, come to me, Jesus. Come to my house. I have a sick person at the house. Will you come? And we ask him, will you come? And he says, yes. You know, a lot of us like to put our pos- ourselves in the position of, as we think we're Jesus in the Bible. And most of us are the people in the crowd. Do you know what I'm saying? When you read that story, I'm going to try to get this t- tightened up because I need to bring some clarity here. Let me put it this way. Jesus didn't minister to all those that were broken and wounded around him because he knows as he's in self-control, when he goes out and heals that girl, when you get good at fixing broken things, all the broken things will come to you. Jesus knows when, he, when you get good at, at, at ministering to where the desire is, not where the need is all the time, or where the hunger is, not where the desperation is all the time, he knows that it'll draw things unto him. Self-control is about learning to say no, learning to say yes. I mean, I'm telling you, Christians need to learn to say no. It's not evil to say no. Like, I really need help on the weekend, and you need to help me move. I need to spend time with my family. No. You know what I'm saying? Like, we need to start making decisions that actually are out of love, not out of desperation. Do you know what I'm saying? Like understanding the difference between important and urgent. My house is on fire. You need to come, Brent. Well, why is it on fire? I lit it on fire. I I can't. I gotta gotta go do some other stuff. You know what I mean? Like we have to start saying no. But part of being saying no is loving. Like who can help set up the conference for 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 Todd? And everybody says yes, but then you then they don't come. It's like, it would have been better for you to just say no out of love and out of respect for the others and to have self-control and to say, no, I can't do that. I need to go pray. I need to get on my face this weekend. That's what I'm going to do. And you want proof of that? Peter, I think it's in Acts chapter 6. Peter is setting, they're ministering to people. It says they're being added to daily. And I'm preaching right now because this is what's coming. And they're being added to daily so much so that Peter stands up and says, hey, guys. Not hey, guy. Hey, dudes. <laughs> hey, people, me and the other apostles, we're not going to be serving tables anymore. But we've assigned this dude, Steve, this is the Brent version, we've assigned these guys, they're going to serve you because we're going to go pray for what's coming next. And we all say, yep, yeah, that's right. And then you say, yeah, that's right, because, because Brent or Mike, or Ronnie, or, or, or Natalie, they, they say that, but they'll still come and serve my table. No, there's a time when we need to steal away and pray for what's coming next. And there's a time you might be the Stephen that says, no, I'll come and serve the table. I'll come and be the one that now serves those. You're trained, you're equipped. 
This is for you guys. I mean, I'm telling you, the group is small tonight, but the ones that are supposed to be here to hear this message are here. Learn to say yes. Learn to say no. Let our yes be yes. Let our no be no. But say no out of love and self-control. That's the message. There's freedom in this. I mean, there's real freedom in this. Holy Spirit. This protects a culture of honor because it stops elevating people to the wrong place. There's no more anointing in me than there is in you. The breakthrough you're looking for doesn't always come from a person that comes. It comes from the person sitting next to you. I'm telling you the truth. I mean, I'm trying to tell you the truth in love. How do I know? I've watched people come in here and grow in two and three months, like at a rate that I'm actually provoked to jealousy on. Like, I knew that person when they first came here. Now, lock it. What's going on? They're in a culture of love. They're in a culture that doesn't elevate the person. It elevates the person, Jesus Christ. Nobody else. That, and it sounds like that should be everywhere. Oh, that's every church. No, it's not. No, it's not. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm, I'm, I'm hurt to say that. I don't think I should have to say that, but I'm saying it. In this house, we need to look at the Christ in each other and be like, there's the breakthrough I'm looking for. I'm going to tell you one quick testimony. When, when Natalie and I came together, we knew God was calling me into ministry. We didn't know what that looks like. We had ideas of what that was supposed to look like. And then we said yes, and like all of our world falls apart. And as I'm going, I'm like a month into this and figuring like God should already have everything established because, come on, it's God. It shouldn't take him any more than 30 days. He built everything in the universe in six and then rested on the seventh. How, how, how come he can't like fix all the stupid decisions I've made and wrap them up in less than 30 days so I can move on and pay my bills and pay my mortgage? I'm the only one that does that. Okay. So 30 days into this, I throw down the gauntlet. I'm like, God, you don't have to believe in me, but somebody needs to believe in me. Show me that somebody believes in what I'm doing. Just one person. That was my test. Just one person. And the Sunday, we were still at the old uh, YMCA. <laughs> we're like moving things in and then moving things out. And it's like on a Sunday, and one person came up to me and handed me an envelope with money in it and said, God told me to give this to you. I believe in you. And God believes in you. And I'm just like, I don't think I said anything because I couldn't say anything. You know what I mean? Like, I'm ready to cash in. The, I'm not up here if that doesn't happen that day because I was ready to cash in. I mean, like, forget this. I'll go back to work. You know what I mean? I'll go back and get a job and forget all this Christian stuff and ministry stuff. But one person believed in me. And that's where your breakthrough's at. You need your breakthrough? It's right next to you. <clears throat> this is supposed to bring life, but I'm like really emotional about it because I know that it's easy to set it up to where we put it on to other people. Or it's coming. It's coming is the mantra of the never coming. <laughs> Here's the mantra that'll never happen. It's coming. It's on its way. Revival's coming. Revival's going to get here. Breakthrough's coming. Breakthrough's coming. Breakthrough. Now, breakthrough's here. And it's right in the room. Revival's coming. Revival's coming. That guy just got saved on Sunday. I'm pretty sure his revival is upon him. Do you know what I'm saying? Don't get it twisted where it's waiting and it's coming and it's coming and it's waiting and it's abundant. It's going to come and it's going to come. And we just need to be patient. Patience is a gift. Maybe we should start to say what we really mean. It's going to start looking like the way I think it should look. That's what you're really saying. Uh-uh. Look around you. I'm telling you, there, there's a revival in this room. And it's ragtaggedy people. I was in sweatpants earlier. So, I'm, I mean, I only dressed up for you guys. I didn't do it for any other reason. I mean, I was in sweatpants. I should have just preached in that. Like my night. That's where I'm the most comfortable. I'm like, Nike sweats, right, honey? And now my wife gets it. She's like, man, I think I need to buy, start buying those sweatsuits. They're really comfortable. I'm like, Hello. <laughs> 
It's like your, that joke that says, my, my bathing suit was like, you should go to the gym. But then the sweatpants stood up and says, oh, nah, girl, you look fine. <laughs> Holy spirit. <laughs> I have those, nah, girl, you look fine mornings a lot where I just get up and I'm like, I can work great in a pair of sweatpants. Holy spirit. Can you recognize the word of the Lord in the strangest people that you know? That's what I have. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on. He rested on a donkey. The word of the Lord came through a donkey. <laughs> like this word's challenging me. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself, but it's like, can we trust the word of the Lord in the most bizarre people that God's going to be sending and has already sent all of us? I mean, let's be honest. Like, if you were going to pick a spiritual battle, would this be the team you'd go with? No, I'm just kidding. This is it. This, you go with the team you have. Like, these are the strong ones. These are the warriors right here in the room. Right here. On Tuesday nights, we meet with a ragtag bunch of people from all over the world, 26 crazy people that actually believe that when they get together, God's going to show up and do something amazing. And every Sunday, every Tuesday, he does. And amazing things happen, and people are getting healed. And people are speaking life where they never spoke life before. I'm telling you what's happening is global. Don't miss it. Don't miss it because you want it to look the way you want it to look. It might not arrive on time. When I was talking to Mike today, and he said, yeah, you know, the grand they're inducing labor. I said, all that aside, I have, I'm, I have no idea what it feels like to be a grandfather, Mike. I said, I only have children. What are you feeling right now? Like, what does it feel like? I want to know, you know, because I can look forward to it. It's coming in the future. And he says, it's brought me to tears and to my knees today. And you have this image of what it's going to be like when you're a grandfather, maybe, or when you become a father. But it shows up different. She was due, like, what, in a week? But they're inducing it, right? That's when she was due, was last weekend. So if they would have scheduled the revival, the little baby named Revival should have showed up last weekend. But life tends to come when it wants to come in a way that you're not always prepared for. When I start repeating myself is when I know it's time to stop. Hold it, let's stand. Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Will you allow us to receive what you're doing despite the vessels that it's going to come in? <laughs> When you send the atheist, Buddhist, man of God, will I receive the word of the Lord? Despite him being saved for 24 hours. And God, I've been saved for 24 years. How come the word of the Lord's coming to the guy who's been saved for 24 minutes? Will we receive? I, I, I'm, I believe he's asking us. So, Father, I, I ask that you would give us hearts to receive the word of the Lord, the kingdom, the revival that's here now, the very presence of God, that healing, healing touch. We don't even care what it looks like, and we don't even want to know what it looks like. We just say yes to it right now. We say yes that it's here. We say yes that you are here. We say thank you for revealing yourself moreover, more ever constantly in a new and refreshing way but we also have to acknowledge that you're already here and you're already doing amazing things you're saving you're healing you're delivering you're casting out demons you're doing all that through this body and there's revival coming to the checkbooks and the bank accounts and we have to acknowledge the way that it looks might not be the way we wanted it to but it's coming will we give credit to the lord when it comes will we thank him for what he's doing when he does it the way he wants to do it i want to just grab hands because i'm telling you 
with your neighbor literally is the breakthrough that you're looking for. This is where the breakthrough is. It's in one another. And I would love if someone would excuse or dismiss the kids. It looks like some of them have already come out. But what if the Lord starts to move the mouths of babes in this church and begins to proclaim the word of the Lord for, through a package that you're not used to That's because it's four feet tall or three feet tall? And they begin to give the utterances of the goodness of God. What if it comes in dreads and, and, and a dread warrior? You know, we need to be ready for it. And I just say right now that the breakthrough is holding your hand right now. That the one person that can believe in you, in the Christ in you, and, and pull you into the family is touching your very hand right now. That the person that's going to say, yeah, I can see the Christ in you. I can see the dreams and visions. You need to grab hand, buddy. When you stand by yourself, you stand alone. And if you stand alone, you're divided. So, Father, we just pray right now that the person in, is standing right or next to you begin to speak the, def, the destiny that God has in your life and to confirm the word of the Lord in you. And I just declare that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.